It's not always easy to get a good start with the Dwarves, especially when you've got a while coming up from the south in the early turns. So here's a guide to give you a really strong start and make that while just go away. The timestamps in the description if you're looking for something specific. For this video I'll show the starting area for Thorgrim, Grudgebauer and Grom Brindle. Although all the tips can be carried over to one Grim Iron Fist, I feel like Belagar's starting campaign is just so different with the objectives he has set for him. He requires his own set of advice, so I might do a video for him at some point in the future. Now between the other Dwarf Lords, it really is down to personal preference and who you want to be fighting early on in the game. But for me, Thorgrim is just the better choice of the three. It kind of boils down to his starting units, and although they are fairly boring vanilla units, the Grudge Thrower just changes the way battles will play out for you, and the way the AI will respond to you in those early games. Because the AI wants to range of a war machine will come at you, it means that with Thorgrim and with that Grudge Thrower, you can pick a hill, you can pick somewhere where you can funnel the enemy into a narrow area, and punish them every step of the way. The Quarrelers are just a top tier unit for me, I absolutely love them, and their ability to fire over the top of your own units means that they're not that vulnerable to counter charge. And the Hammerers, since they're buffed some time ago now, they just mince through everything that comes in the early game. Uh, they really are a good damage dealer, just you know, make sure you keep them out of the way of uh, enemy missile troops. Thorgrim's abilities as well, which we'll have a look at a little bit later on, his skills, I find in his tree, he has more abilities that buff all the units of his army. So when you've only got one army at the beginning of the game, he's just the better choice. It's important to nail your build order in the first few turns. The Silver Road province with Karazakarak basically needs to become like a fortress. It needs to do a whole bunch of things for you. It needs to give you a really good gold income per turn, despite the fact we're going to be increasing Thorgrim's army. It needs to grow through its population, and it needs to be able to help defend itself against aggression, and particularly wars from the south. Now in that vein, one of the absolute bits of advice I would give you is, don't tech up too early. The buildings, the units, the upkeep, they're all really expensive, and they will cripple that turn by turn income which is just going to stiff you over in the early game. You won't be able to expand as quickly, you won't be able to replenish losses as quickly, and then that war comes and just steamrollers you. Now your Dwarf Warriors, and to a lesser extent your Dwarf Miners, are more than capable enough to deal with most of the stuff you get in the early game. You add to that, whatever starting units your Legendary Lord bring you, and your Legendary Lord itself, actually your army's very capable, so you don't need to go chasing the admittedly very sexy units down at the far end of the tech tree. Don't worry about it now, there's only really one unit we need to go get in the early game. So with that in mind, coming over to Karazakarak, the first thing I'll do every single time is add a gem mineshaft. It's the most gold you can get at this tier, it adds an instant tradable resource, and there's a nice discount for some of the better units coming on later in the game. The other thing obviously is Karazakarak needs to become a level 2 settlement pretty quickly. Now this next bit in the build order was a bit controversial when I did it in the last video so hopefully I'll explain it a little bit better this time round. What I'm aiming to do with Karazakarak once it becomes level 2 in 3 turns time is I want to add the clan barracks in place of the sparring chamber. Now a lot of people will go, no, don't do that, don't do that, it's a tier 3 building, you're wasting a slot in Karazakarak, you should build it in the Pillars of Grugni or Mount Squeakhorn. But actually, we don't need to at the moment. Like we said, we're not racing to tech up, we're not adding a lot of new stuff, and by the time it's turn 2, I'm going to get two new slots, or turn 3 rather, I'm going to get two new slots anyway. What I'm trying to do is get that quarreler unit as quickly as possible so I can add it to Thorgrim's army. It makes your first quest battle so much easier because you've got more quarrelers to deal with the enemy and with uh, the trolls that spawn in behind you. And it just helps keep your casualty count in each battle down which is an important thing I'm going to come on to a little while later in the video. 
So doing it this way will allow me to build Quarrelers from the beginning of turn 6. If I try and do it at one of the other settlements, because I've got to A, capture the settlement, B, wait for the population to upgrade that settlement, and then C, you know, build the prerequisite buildings, I can't get Quarrelers building before turn 10. And as we're trying to build that momentum, waiting four turns for something I could have on turn six, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So get it done now, and when you need the slot, once you've done everything else you need to do at Mount Squiggle and Pillars of Grugny, then take it, destroy it over here, and build it here, or more likely somewhere else where you get some of the nice benefits from some of the other buildings. So with that done, a couple of the other things we're going to do here... With Thorgrim's army, I'm going to come on to why um, we're doing this in a little while. But what we want to do is add three more units of Dwarf Warriors. I'm sure I don't need to sell you on why we do Dwarf Warriors instead of Miners. But we're not going to get aggressive this turn. We want to build the army up quickly and then go and smash the rest of this province. On the other front, just looking at research very, very quickly... Before, I recommended coming up to Kazid Subsidies and one of these things up here. Actually, now I've kind of changed my mind on that. I would go for either Gather the Throngs or Levy Missile Warriors. The reason for this is, although that 5% um, is going to help you later on, at the moment, 5% of nothing is still nothing. And we're not getting that much income at this stage. Whereas, opening up some of these trees for more ammunition, increased um, veterancy on recruited units, more missile damage or leadership, uh, a melee attack defense, etc., etc., is going to have more of an effect on your army straight away. So consider one of those. For this one, do you know what? I'm going to go Levy Missile Warriors, so that's ready and in place for when our quarrelers arrive. If ever there was going to be a prize for a really obvious heading in a How To Do Total War video, Use Your Army Effectively is probably going to win it. But I'm not talking about on the battlefield, I'm talking about on the campaign map. Now if we have a look at how much money I'm spending on Thorgrim every turn, 1,200 gold. I've got to make sure I'm getting that worth out of him every single turn. Now I'm not necessarily talking about sacking settlements and actually earning that money back every turn. What I'm doing, what I'm talking about is making sure that he's being effective in every single turn. Sometimes that's going to be attacking an enemy, destroying an army, or sacking a, a, a settlement. Sometimes that's going to be just sitting in a settlement and providing you peace of mind, either by helping defend it, or when you spot an enemy, enemy army, but you're not quite sure which way it's going to go, him staying there is going to give you that visibility and allow you to react the next turn. That's fine where you really will waste your army and spend upkeep that you really don't need to is when you've taken so many casualties that you're having to replenish for a number of turns now every so often that's useful when you are doing a last stand battle when you've had to fight multiple stacks with one there are clearly going to be battles you're going to take a load of casualties but where you can stack the odds in your favor so that you can either overwhelm the enemy or completely tactically outmaneuver them so that they take a huge amount of casualties and you regain yours back in a turn two turns maximum hopefully now that explains yeah. why rather than attacking turn one i'm actually waiting for these three units to arrive as we can see i'm a seven stack plus the three that i'm waiting to build nashrak's a six stack it only gives me one unit advantage thanks thorgrim Waiting for those three extra units means I'm going to be able to surround a couple of his units, make sure I've got two units to every one of his to engage in combat, there or thereabouts, and hopefully, by stacking up on one flank, I'll be able to roll down. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the combat thing. In the description, and hopefully popping up on your screen right now, there's a link to the first video I fight um, just in a moment, so you can watch that if you're unsure, but I'm sure a lot of people are sat there going, yeah, we know all this, thanks very much. Okay, so still beginning of turn two, and what's really nice about this is we've actually got Thorgrim up to level four, so we've got two skill points. Uh, we should have had two skill points. Oh no, that's right. I've used one there, so you can see there's two skills now. Root Marcher and Grudge Against the Greenskins, as we talked about before. Uh, the other thing I'm likely to do here is I'm actually going to go for 
the leadership aura size, again concentrating on the army. Now one of the things I want to say about those battles that we've just done um, is that beware auto resolve, even when the odds are in your favour you just seem to take more casualties than the uh, AI intended or than you would when you let the AI deal with your army. Um, obviously later on in the game I completely understand that you would. So looking at the pillars of Grungly then our second objective already been done because it's got a barley field there that removes our any choice that we that we would need to make we've got the barley field we know we want to grow the province this is nice and easy and this is what I was saying earlier about wanting to get the quarrelers it's four turns now before we can upgrade one of these two so four turns you know I'd much rather have Kara's a character level two first than one of these so, beginning of turn 3, and all I did, at the end of last turn I added 2 more units of Dwarf Warriors rather than 3. I, I find 6 is enough in this army when you back them up with the Hammerers and the Miners. And, surprisingly, Thorgrim Grudgebearer has now gained another skill point. Um, from here on out, I feel like this is a lot of personal choice. Um, I'll either go full plate armor, I mean he hasn't taken much damage, so I might just uh, go for Inspiring Presence and make that armor, sorry, that army absolutely unbreakable um you know the, the the skills that i do take when they become um available ancient bloodlines always good when he's in friendly territory um because it then uh, uh, gives you access to these bits over here high kings a lovely um ability to have as well all i will say is that this one here the oath of vengeance makes thorgrim almost as good at taking on um another lord as Grom Brindle or Ungrim is um, when he's supported by a unit. He's obviously not as good as them, but it, it certainly bridges part of the gap, and it, as you saw before, it makes a massive dent on their morale. Um, commandment, because I am playing on hard, obviously I've got that difficulty level thing going on, so I just tend to go for the um, public order and the untainted bit, just for the time being. Once this province is stabilised, that's that. The only other thing we do need to change is obviously I'm going to get rid of the sparring chamber. Uh, next turn, what I'll go for is the trinket maker. After that, I'm looking to get both of the other buildings in this province, um, Mount Squeakhorn and Pearls of Grungly, up to level 2 themselves. And what I'll look to add there with them, uh, and one of them uh, is a uh, refractory, it's another tradable resource. Improves your public order. I'll also look to start going to watch rooms for both of them. Um, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, if you put your refectory into Karaz of Karak, you can get a watch room in both. And it means that you've then got six units from the garrison with a uh, war machine as well. You also get another six units from the outpost. That's 12 units to defend against a war. Which brings us nicely on to Beware the War. You're going to have to deal with one sooner or later. And with the AI, sometimes it is sooner rather than later. But there are ways to mitigate that. As I've just said, you can have 12 units in a settlement before you've even started thinking about armies. Now, what I will do very shortly is probably in a couple of turns... I will come and recruit um, a Lord just to pop into Pillars of Grugney. And the reason for that is I maybe give him a couple of ranged units. And he can then, depending on what comes up, whether the war comes across here or up here, he can sit in a settlement and just jump between them uh, to go wherever he's needed. Karaz of Karak's more than capable of defending itself, especially when you consider how the AI is in siege battles. Now, a couple of the other things that I would consider doing is at this stage you'll have enough Ulth Gold to craft something. Now, I will almost always go for the Miner's Helm. And the reason I'm going to get the Miner's Helm is it's extra armor and extra leadership. And that goes really well on that Lord that we're going to recruit to help defend. That leadership is just spot on. Extra armor always helps, just makes him tanky, able to soak a bit of damage, go into a unit and deal some... Um, you know, deal some casualties to the enemy. 
Another way, and this is quite a clever way of dealing with the war, is later on you can jump Thorgrim over, come down to Karagdron, destroy it um, completely. I know people want to sack it. Um, you can do if you want, but obviously that adds an extra turn to this. So, turn 4, jump across. Turn 5, destroy Karagdron, or sack it. Turn 6, raise it. Turn 7, jump back across, and we're ready for Quarrelers. If you just raise it, yeah, you're missing out on a little bit of gold, but it does mean then that you're back in Mount Squighorn, pretty much ready to have Quarrelers added. You can then head north to the quest battle. Anyway, that's by the by. The reason you raise it is because the AI will often go after it to recolonize. Now, the War Army obviously is going to go around and attack stuff, but if the 20 stack say Grimgore Ironhide that spawned the war goes after Karagdron instead what he's going to do is he's going to colonize it lose half his army to colonizing and he's either going to have to rebuild his army or you're taking on an army at half strength so make sure every so often you just raise something to the south give them some sort of sacrificial uh, settlement to go afterward uh, go after and and that'll be great Next couple of turns, what I'm going to look forward to do is is head up north, take Mount Gumbad. Definitely, you really want to get up there by about turn 10. So, quest battle first, Mount Gumbad afterwards. Bear in mind, you're going to have to seize it, so it's going to, or siege it rather. So, Thorgrim's going to be away from your home province for a little while, and this is where you're a little bit vulnerable. But what I'm aiming to do is take Mount Gumbad. Possibly Grim Grom Peak, although to be honest, Zuffbar are pretty good at taking that before you get there. And if Ungrim does his job and destroys Nashrak's lair, what you'll have ended up with is trade with dwarves to the north. A whole bunch of extra income, and then you know that at the time being you can focus all of your army, all of your strength, all of your military might south. The other reason you want to take Mount Gumbad, and unfortunately um, I don't have it to show you here, is later on in the game when it gets to level 3 or level 4, there's a bright stone mine in there. It's absolutely something you want to go for. Getting the bright stone mine will give you 1500 gold per turn and a ridiculous plus 6 veterancy for your artillery units. It's just ridiculous. It's really good. So my build order, I would go... Population growth, then public order for Mount Gumbad, and then I'd add whatever it is you want to go for after that. Obviously, as long as these settlements up here are secure and in dwarf hands. Just two quick things on diplomacy. Firstly, make sure you make friends with as many races as you can. Um, only the good ones, obviously. Um, the more friends you have, the more trade agreements you have, the more trade agreements you have, the more money you have. Simples. Part of that, Greybeard's Prospect is make sure you get that non-aggression pact on turn one. I found that for some reason, if you try doing that from turn two onwards, they're not interested. So get that nailed on your first turn. Secondly, beware of defensive and military alliances. The amount of time I've had an AI alliance go and attack at one of my other alliances... And then I've lost trade agreements or I've become unreliable and it's caused me no end of problems. So really think it through when you're offered or decide to go for a defensive or a military alliance. So just a couple of points for when you've taken Mount Gumbad and you're looking to push south. Bear in mind what I said about raised settlements. Uh, keep one of those between you and the enemy. It'll keep draining their armies and make things easier for you. Try and aim for Iron Rock and Dot Karaz. They'll give bonuses to your melee and ranged troops that you recruit after you capture them. And also, see if you can keep a little bit of the pressure off Barakvar. They're one of your trading partners, so they're a source of income. Keep the pressure off of them, um, and they'll be able to assist you and also be a target for enemy aggression. Other than that, guys, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If there's anything else I can help with, send me a message or let me know in the comments below. Keep drinking, keep gaming, stay safe.